This video is brought to you by Paragon, my own original sci-fi novel, now available on Amazon. Check the description for links where you can buy. As Babylon 5 was going into its monumental fourth season, tragedy struck. The network the show was airing on would be shut down. Assuming the worst, creator and showrunner J. Michael Straczynski brought his planned Babylon 5 stories ahead of schedule for a jam-packed final season. However, out of the blue, Turner Network Television swooped in and picked up the sci-fi masterpiece for a fifth season, along with three television movies and whatever JMS wanted to do with his ever-expanding sci-fi universe. Thus, plans for a Babylon 5 spin-off show were put into motion, but as the backdoor pilot A Call to Arms went out the door, tensions were building behind the scenes. Set five years after the events of Babylon 5, ancient allies of the Shadows have infected Earth with a plague which will wipe out all life on the planet in five years. Thus, Captain Matthew Gideon assembles a diverse crew aboard the IAS Excalibur to search the stars for a cure. And so the stage is set for no doubt another intricately woven, galaxy-reshaping sci-fi saga which was cancelled before the first episode was even broadcast. Studio meddling ruining a good thing is a tale as old as time, and unfortunately Crusade befell the same fate. Allegedly after some number crunching, the TNT execs determined that their regular audience wasn't interested in Babylon 5, and so producing spin-offs and TV movies may not have been profitable. Trouble is, they had already signed a contract with JMS and essentially sabotaged the project to get out of producing it. This is just the worst kind of short-sighted, heartless dick measuring which has come to define a lot of Hollywood studio politics. TNT picked up Babylon 5 for a full fifth season and three TV movies, yet only now did they check if their regular audience wanted to watch it? At the same time, who even cares if a regular audience wanted to watch it when Babylon 5 had a vehemently passionate fanbase ready and waiting? Yes, Babylon 5 was never a rating smash, but thanks to critical acclaim, a dedicated fanbase, and Straczynski's efficient running, Babylon 5 was kept on the air all that time. And yet TNT decided to throw away all that goodwill because the people who watched LA Heat weren't interested? Bullshit. Because Crusade was essentially killed in its sleep, it's pretty difficult to judge as what there is available to look at isn't a complete show or even a complete season. Rather, it's the not fully intact demo reel of what Crusade could have been. But with 13 episodes released, did Crusade have any worthwhile potential or would it have been a disappointing follow-up either way? First of all, I have to say that the premise itself is terrific. Switching from a station-based show to a ship-based show was only natural, and the ticking time bomb style setup is great. It also sets a perfect stage to not only get entangled in the complex politics of the galaxy like Babylon 5 did, but it also gives us a chance to see the even more ancient and mysterious parts of the galaxy. Presentation-wise, it's pretty strong, almost on par with the later seasons of Babylon 5. Sure, it doesn't have the gloss or expense of contemporary Star Trek or Stargate, but the excellent production design, flashy VFX, and strong direction compensate for the smaller budget. I also absolutely love the Excalibur. I don't know how exactly this giant thing is classed as a destroyer, but it's a bold design and the ship is full of plenty of cool gadgets and weaponry. Easily the weakest part of the show is something which I brought up in A Call to Arms, the music score. I'm assuming Christopher Frankie was busy with other things and I understand wanting to give Crusade its own sonic identity, but the score for this show is just awful. It's such a bizarre concoction of styles and sounds with no coherent themes, but the worst crime the music commits is its utter failure to carry the drama of the episodes. For some reason, several episodes do the call to arms thing of muting all sound during battles except the music and montaging through the sequence. I can't fathom why Crusade does this. Babylon 5 had the best space battles of any sci-fi franchise ever. I totally stand by that statement. Not only did they deliver the spectacle, but they also engrossed the viewer in the drama. Why Crusade did the exact opposite is beyond me. Despite the other strengths of the show's presentation, this aspect often cripples what should be the climaxes or heartfelt moments of so many stories. In terms of characters, it's overall a strong ensemble. Captain Gideon, played by Gary Cole, was no doubt a casualty of the cancellation too soon fact of the show. The gist of the character is clear among the pantheon of other Babylon 5 universe commanders. Sinclair was the square-jawed mythic hero, Sheridan was the lovable, morally upstanding leader, and Gideon is the gritty but charismatic ship captain with a dark past. However, because of the short time spent with the character, his most interesting developments are no doubt never to be seen. The shadow-like vessel he saw out in space, the strange talking box he has, and Galen's implied greater plans for him are all fascinating, but unfortunately we only have the setup without the payoff. But for what's there, Cole does a good enough job. He balances the dry wit and down-to-earth toughness with ease, and overall Gideon is a highly watchable lead. Galen, however, is the absolute show-stealer. 
Edward Woodward's thespian experience has him speaking in this truly hypnotic tone throughout the show, and his grasp of the philosophical and humorous dialogue is remarkable. Techno mages are an utterly fascinating and largely unexplored part of the Babylon 5 universe, and because of this mysteriousness, Galen is often the most enjoyable part of most episodes, but there's also an undercurrent of suspicion. You get the sense Galen is tapped into something the other characters aren't even aware of, and because of his shrouded motivations and innate charisma, the dynamic between him and the rest of the cast is consistently enjoyable and surprising. Daniel Day Kim does a good job as John Matheson. The new dynamic between telepaths and society at large gives Matheson a lot of nuance as a character, even if we're only given small glimpses of it. Kim in general has always felt right at home in these kinds of shows, which makes him a reliable presence on the bridge, and his solemn line delivery ensures his bouts of technobabble are never boring. David Allen Brooks as Dr. Max Eilerson is terrific. His overt cockiness, backed up with his obvious intelligence, makes for interesting clashes with the other crew members. They all hate having him around, but he's also essential to their mission, and Eilerson revels in that frustration. It's almost as if he's daring the other characters to take a punch at him every time he opens his mouth to deliver another self-assured speech. He's built to be unlikable, but his dynamic with the rest of the crew really makes the dialogue crackle. Carrie Dobro as Doreen in a field did a good job with a mostly tired trope. The scrappy loner thief has been done many times, but Dorina's extremely personal connection to the Drac adds a more interesting dimension to the character, and Dobro definitely has charisma to spare. I only wish we could have seen a relationship with Galen progress more, another element which was no doubt meant to be explored later on in the future episodes we never got to see. Marjean Holden as Dr. Sarah Chambers was essentially the heart of the crew. While the others are all broken or secretive people, Chambers has a sincerely emotional backstory and motivation. Unfortunately, she's rarely the focus of the episodes, but she's a welcome addition to the cast nonetheless. Being only one half of a first season, Crusade was obviously still setting the stage for its future story arcs, but with a focus on more episodic adventures to accommodate a new audience. As a result, the 13 episodes we have are a mixed bag of stories of varying quality. Rather than go point by point through all the released episodes and make this video absurdly long, I just want to give a shout out to the strongest episodes in Crusade's short run. Warzone, the first episode, although JMS once put this at the second to last in the watching order, which is baffling to me, is a good first outing to set the scene for the new show. Although it does climax in a silent, terribly scored space battle, the Magnificent Seven-style assembly of the crew is a fun tour around their personalities, and seeing the strong dynamic of the cast emerge is lots of fun. For a diehard Babylon 5 fan, the recontextualization of the lore is also intriguing. No more Psycore, overall galactic peace, and no more Vorlons or Shadows. While Season 5 of the predecessor show struggled to find good material in this new status quo, Crusade manages to make it interesting. The Path of Sorrows was a welcome deep dive into the backstories of the main cast. This is one of the few times the odd music score actually works within the story. The esoteric presence of the recovered alien and the surreal transitions to the flashbacks is super unsettling. The flashback sequences feature some well-written drama with Matheson's experience in the psy core being truly gut-wrenching. The feeling of melancholy this episode leaves is spellbinding. Appearances and other deceits felt almost like a classic TNG or Voyager episode. It was a delight to see the slimy Nightwatch guy from Babylon 5 make a reappearance, having no doubt slimed his way out of Clark's regime and into a new career. I only wish we could have seen him blown out the airlock by the end of the story. The main conflict of the episode is well staged and provides plenty of tension. The main kicker at the end of Gideon dictating a condolence letter is a tried and true JMS trick to make this more than a disposable episodic adventure. Racing the Night is my personal favourite of the show. As I said, I love me some Lovecraftian style horror, and the haunting atmosphere surrounding the ancient city in the majority of the episode is great. The eerie flying saucers and their hollow black colouring is super creepy, and their dissecting weaponry makes it even worse. When the mystery finally gives way, we get some genuinely great space action, which isn't muted for no good reason. While the ultimate design of the aliens is a bit disappointing, the condition their culture is in is pretty horrifying. It's episodes like this I would look forward to had Crusade not been screwed over. So to bring up the big question, Crusade, did it suck? No. I mean, it's difficult to judge an unfinished product, but in terms of potential, there was actually a lot of promise with Crusade. While I have my problems with the show and a good handful of the episodes were pretty disposable, I could have seen this becoming a worthy successor to Babylon 5. I mean, it's certainly better than whatever the hell Legend of the Rangers was trying to be. Attempting to follow the masterpiece of Babylon 5's epic saga is an incredibly difficult task, but Crusade was a decent enough stab at it. Who knows, maybe if Crusade got its five seasons, it would have ultimately disappointed. But with Straczynski at the helm, a strong cast and a killer premise, I can't imagine it being a total failure. Clear Mountain asks, What is your favourite animated sci-fi movie and series? 
I'm afraid I can't really think of an animated sci-fi movie off the top of my head, but for a series I am fond of the Roughnecks Starship Troopers Chronicles show, however in terms of favourite I'll go with Space Battleship Yamato 2199. I thought that was just the perfect reboot of the original show. It retains the pulpy adventure feel of the original while also updating it with some more advanced crisp animation and fun new takes on older characters. I'm thinking of doing some videos on the Space Battleship Yamato franchise just so I can talk more about 2199. If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. You can see videos early on my Patreon for as little as $5 a month. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank my patrons Chris Lord, Andy Luke, Larry Bennett, James, James Vanderhaeg, T. Stoney, L. Carton, and Millie Coleman. Until next time, have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.